Friends and colleagues, it is now time, I think, to begin proceedings uh, proper. And in this context, I can think of no one better suited than getting, getting us underway than Mr Peter Jennings. Peter needs no introduction to many of you in this room, but for those less familiar, as a long-standing director of the Australian Strategic and Policy Institute, Peter has been at the centre of defence and security debates in this country and internationally. He remains a leading figure in the field. Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. Uh, I'm Peter Jennings, still getting used to my uh, new job title as a Professor of Practice at the University of uh, New South Wales. Um, thank you, Emma, for that. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Peter Khalil uh, this morning, who's going to be uh, our keynote speaker. Key uh, Peter is the member for the seat of Wills in Victoria, first elected in 2016 uh, and re-elected in 2019 and 2020. Um, I was very interested to look uh, overnight at your extensive committee service and it's worth just noting uh, the committees that Peter is on and active in. So he's chair of the Intelligence uh, and Security Committee, has been since uh, September of uh, this year to the present. Uh, he's on the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee. Um, he's the deputy chair of the Treaties Committee uh, and serves also on the Human Rights Committee. Uh, and if you see a pattern uh, emerging in that, that it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not coincidental. It's very welcome to uh, see a, a Member of Parliament that has such a level of specialisation on international affairs, defence, uh, intelligence and security. Now, before uh, his government service, Peter has uh, Peter worked as the Executive Director for Corporate Affairs, uh, Strategy and Communications uh, at SBS, and was also the Victorian Multicultural Commissioner. He worked as a policy analyst uh, for the Strategic Policy and Intelligence Group uh, of the Department of Defence. I think I'm right in saying, Peter, at the time I was running it, so um, I'm, I'm going to uh, take some of your uh, glory as, uh, as reflected credit there. Um, he was Director of National Security Policy for the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq and Assistant Director of the Iraq Task Force at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Then uh, Peter moved on to become National Security Advisor to Kevin Rudd, both as Leader of the Opposition and Prime Minister, uh, and then Senior Advisor to Minister for Defence Joel Fitzgibbon. Peter has also been a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution and an adjunct social professor at the University of Sydney Centre for International Security. Something I didn't know, Peter, uh, but certainly worth mentioning after leaving school, he competed on the international tennis circuit and once ranked number 25 domestically for singles. And um, I can claim no credit for that uh, skill what whatsoever. Uh, Peter also uh, gained uh, degrees of uh, BA and LLB from the University of Melbourne uh, and in 2001 graduated Master of Laws in the field of international law uh, at the Australian National University. Peter, uh, it's a great honour to welcome you to our conference. You're our uh, uh, kick-off speaker and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, and then I will have an in-conversation discussion uh, with Peter uh, after that on our comfortable NPC couch before uh, we go to uh, Q&A from the audience. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Khalil. Well, thank you, Peter, and good morning, everyone. I, uh, I'm not sure about that tennis reference. Uh, my, my claim to fame with tennis now is that I'm the Prime Minister's doubles partner, uh, and when I play against him, he's always better than me. That's the, the most important thing to remember. He's a very good tennis player himself, uh, Prime Minister, has uh, played for many, many years. Um, I do want to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present and thank uh, Professor 
uh, of practice at UNSW, Peter Jennings, for the invitation. Of course, Professor Emma Sparks, the Rector of Un Un University of New South Wales, uh, Canberra. Um, and also, there's many dignitaries in this room, but I think it's worth a, a quick shout out. I spied a few people. Jim Caruso, the former head of mission here in, uh, in Canberra. Welcome back to Australia. Uh, George Brandis is here, I think. Uh, George, ex uh, High Commissioner of, uh, in the UK, but former Attorney General. Welcome, George. Um, Kim Beasley, of course, is here, uh, former Ambassador to the US, uh, former Governor of Western Australia, former Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister, an all round legend of defence policy and strategy. Welcome, Kim, it's great to see you. Um, and also, Professor Leslie Seabick uh, is here, Chair of the National Institute of Strategic Resilience, and I also see uh, His Excellency the Ambassador for Lithuania, Darius. If I've missed anyone, I apologise, uh, but thank you all for being here today. It's wonderful. It's quite a gathering, actually, and uh, we're in very good company this morning, a wealth of knowledge and experience in defence policy and strategy. Uh, so all of us here today, um, well, it's probably true to say you all know a lot more than I can tell you with a few bland talking points. Um, you don't need to be told about the changed geostrategic environment that Australia faces. You don't need to be told about an increasingly volatile Indo-Pacific region. You don't need to be told that right now, in the period we are living through, that Australia confronts the most serious challenges to global and regional security and stability since World War II. Of course, I've actually done that. I've told you that again. Um, I've articulated probably an assessment you've no doubt heard um, numerous times in, in numerous rhetorical variations, but it bears repeating because it is also very true. Australia's strategic environment has deteriorated more rapidly than we anticipated. Military modernisation is occurring at an unprecedented rate. Capabilities are rapidly advancing and their reach expanding. The risk of confrontation and conflict has grown. It is, I think, I know, and I can feel it as well, instinctively, a very unique moment in history that we all face. Uh, those of us here who are probably old enough to remember seminal moments in history, the Cuban Missile Crisis, or even the duck and cover drills in the 50s and 60s. Some of you might remember that. They, uh, the hiding under the tables at school actually went on into the 70s and 80s. I remember I have a patchy memory of that when I was a primary school kid. Um, but in, in all seriousness, in my living memory, in my, in, my, in my life, this is it. This is the most critical time in the 21st century. And it's critical for the future of our children and for our grandchildren. And the Indo-Pacific region, Australia's region, is at the centre of the strategic contest for the future. Notwithstanding the war in Ukraine, the Indo-Pacific is the most important theatre at the centre of what is a global strategic contest. This is where it's happening. A region where the future shape of the 21st century will be determined. What world we and generations to come will live in will be decided in our neighbourhood. So I hope that's not too melodramatic uh, for this early in the morning to say what happens in the next few years will be decisive, that our decisions, our effort, the actions that we take, the actions that we don't take over the next five to 10 years will matter to the extent. They won't only be, in my view, consequential, they'll be determinative of our way of life and our future prosperity. So what we, what we, what we and how well we do it will matter not just for the next 10 years, but for generations to come. And it, it's within this context that AUKUS, the AUKUS framework is a key part of our response to this changing geostrategic environment. It is not a new defence alliance or pact, nor is it a, a change in strategy. It is a framework to deepen practical cooperation in developing leading edge military uh, capabilities and technologies. A trilateral technology transfer accelerator. So we've been working with our partners in the United States and the United Kingdom uh, through the AUKUS framework to enhance Australia's defence and make us an even more capable security partner, better able to support a secure, stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific. And AUKUS contributes to Australia's preparedness, and that is a key element of Australia's contribution to multilateral collective deterrence, to the objective of regional and, and global security that we share with our allies and our partners. And so AUKUS should be seen as an element in shaping our strategic circumstances in favour of Australia's national interests, along with the Quad, along with the five power defence arrangements, along with ASEAN, along with other multilateral regional and multilateral architecture um, and the partnerships that we have in the region. 
AUKUS complements these and all of our international efforts. And it's all of these elements, I think, together, when put together, that will serve us to prop up, to preserve, to defend that liberal rules-based order and to, to, to deter parties from moving from competition to confrontation to conflict. We talk about prop up. I've written a piece, actually, for ASPE a while back called The Fulcrum of Middle Powers. Fulcra comes from the Latin, uh, Latin word fulcra to uh, it's the leg of a chair to prop up a table. The importance of middle powers, partners in the region, propping up, supporting, working collectively to protect that liberal rules-based order and all it entails is something that we have to do. It's our responsibility now. AUKUS can be seen as an integral element in that multilateral collective deterrence needed to make adversaries think twice before resorting to the use of force as a means of changing the strategic circumstances to their advantage. Therefore, advancing AUKUS is critically important. And the focus of AUKUS efforts is that pointy end of the spear, the, the capabilities that are at pointy end of the spear, that will deliver Australia, will actually help accelerate Australia's contribution to that overall multilateral collective effort. The Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles has spoken of a porcupine effect uh, of our defence posture. I reckon uh, it should be an echidna, um, but the pointy end of those sharp quills, the Kim says no. Sharper. Okay, thank you, Kim. And he's got zoology as well on his resume. Um, but those sharp quills, whether they're a porcupine or echidna, uh, have the same effect. They, de they deter aggressors. So AUKUS is more important than just submarines, as important as they are as a long-range naval capability that provides that strategic advantage in terms of surveillance and protection of our maritime approaches. But AUKUS will also deliver, uh, not only deliver nuclear powered submarines for Australia, that long uh, quill that can reach, that has that long reach, but will also um, provide us with, and guide the accelerated development of advanced defence capabilities in a much shorter time frame, uh, years rather than decades, where they will have the most impact. Probably you could say they'd be the sharp quills. Uh, better for a deterrence and our operational effectiveness, undersea capability, electronic warfare, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, advanced cyber, near-term capabilities that have been added in hypersonics and counter-hypersonics, and of course the information sharing and innovation uh, to make these advanced capabilities possible. Australia is working quite well, really well, with our partners. Uh, and we're advancing AUKUS, and of course that won't be a surprise to this audience given the history of our alliances, our partnerships, our friendships, all the cultural affinity and shared values that we have with the US and UK. I can attest to that, having been to Washington twice this year and, and Indo-Pacific Command more recently. We're working cooperatively to address gaps and barriers. And there are some gaps that need to be addressed in, in order to ensure that that trilateral technology transfer can occur smoothly. By definition, a technology transfer accelerator needs to be fast. But there are some issues with, for instance, US protective laws and regulations with regards to technology transfer in particular, which all of our three nations are focused on working to get through together. These are long-standing protective barriers within the US system around defence industry and defence capability. Similar barriers, of course, exist within the Australian and UK systems as well. Now, some might say that these barriers are Cold War um, relics of the Cold War, but they do continue to serve some important purposes and, and with some adjustments, could complement the goals of the AUKUS partnership. But right now, given the speed at which we must move AUKUS forward, these issues risk holding some aspects of our work back. We are working through these issues as partners and friends, as we should. More broadly, there is also a question about what production we can do in Australia, should do in Australia. And this is of critical importance. For Australia to be able to acquire the defence assets in the quantity we need and in the time we need them to be a contributor to that multilateral collective deterrence. It's not going to happen without working together to open up and break down some of these barriers to Australian production of an array of weaponry and defence kit. It's not going to happen unless we have smoother technology transfer and the ability to have production facilities in Australia. This is critical, especially in the context of the immense pressure that both the US and the UK defence industries are under with respect to the war in Ukraine and their support for that uh, for Ukrainian forces. But I am confident uh, we, the government, now are addressing these issues 
working through them constructively and making progress. I want to conclude with a, a, a final comment about public perception and public understanding of AUKUS. So beyond this room, everyone here really has a great understanding. You're in that national security community in, in some respects, so you get it. But beyond those of us here at this conference, we have a lot of work to do to break down some elements of misunderstanding, uh, both in the general public, in the media, uh, with our international partners with respect to AUKUS. You are part of that education process. You are part of that narrative shaping as well, given your expertise and the expertise in this room. More broadly, you're part of being able to better explain what it means when Australia acquires new, expanded or even enhanced defence capabilities, that the purpose of this stronger defence capability is not to escalate towards conflict. It's actually about achieving the inverse, deterring conflict, lessening the possibility of conflict. And the more we strengthen and enhance our defence capability, the more effectively we do that, we actually build global collective deterrence, the more we lessen the possibility of the factors that may lead to conflict. It's surprising, but most people don't understand that when you talk to them. And when we do this, we also change and shape our strategic circumstances. And in this, I believe, we have agency through our collective efforts. Our competitors, our adversaries, whether they be state actors or non-state actors, do not have and never really have had an unchangeable or predestined trajectory to primacy or, or dominance. What we do does already and can in the future impel our adversaries to make a different calculation, make them think twice before they decide to use force to change the strategic circumstances in their favour. The purpose of our increased and enhanced defence capabilities, which AUKUS will contribute to and accelerates, is to deter competition from escalating to uh, confrontation and then on to all-out conflict. Its purpose is to maintain an order that ensures the security, stability and prosperity of our Indo-Pacific region, which is so central to our national interest. We're a trading nation, a middle power that benefits as others do from glo a gro global rules-based order. That international rule of law that the Prime Minister has spoken of, that nations abide by for their common benefit. Advancing AUKUS and all it entails is central to those very noble and worthy strategic objectives. Thank you. We're actually on at this point. I think Aye. we are. I think we are. That's great. Peter, thank you so much for that. Um, sitting here at this couch, um, all I can think of is that scene from the Forrest Gump movie in the park, right? Life is like a box of chocolates. And um, I'm very disappointed you didn't bring a box of chocolates for us to share while, while we have this uh, conversation. But instead, we uh, talked about... Uh, Porcupines, we talked about echidnas, deterrence, which I think is really the sort of key unspoken word um, when it comes to thinking about uh, advancing AUKUS, and timing, which is, is also uh, uh, brings out a set of issues which I think we should explore. But um, Peter, I, I wanted to start by understanding your personal engagement in, in the foreign uh, and defence space. So many MPs focus on domestic matters, uh, and yet it's very noticeable that you've, you've gone into the parliament really wanting to build uh, a specialisation. Why, why are you so committed to Australia's position internationally? What, what motivates you to sort of make this your niche in, in parliament? Um, thanks, Peter. I think um, the answer to that is values intertwined with history. Um, my maternal grandfather fought uh, in Montgomery's 8th Army in North Africa. He was an Egyptian soldier in the auxiliary forces for, for the British. Uh, he taught me all about World War II and the history, the North African campaigns, of course. My dad uh, um, escaped Egypt because he wrote a book that was critical of the communist presence in Egypt following the Six-Day War and the, the presence of the KGB and 60,000 technical Russian advisors. And he was hounded out and chased by the Mokhabarat or the intelligence services. And I think Melbourne was the furthest away from Cairo. 
Um, Mum gave me a sort of a cosmopolitan outlook, you know, her that Mediterranean sensibility, the engagement with the French and the Italian and the Greek and Jewish uh, peoples of Egypt during the 50s and 60s, which she transposed to, to Melbourne and the beginning of multiculturalism in this country. She was an interpreter for Weary Dunlop. Um, you know, Dad used to take me to... Uh, uh, anti-apartheid concerts in support of the ANC, taught me all about African politics. Um, my uncle was Vietnamese, he married an Egyptian woman who was a distant relative, that's multiculturalism for you. And I learned all about Vietnam and Vietnamese politics by the time I was 10. <coughs> so I was infused with um, discussions around international politics, understanding the world, the way it works, and hearing from a range of so many interesting people. But I think that, 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 that's the passion part of it. That's what gave me the passion around international affairs. But what lit the sort of spark, sparked the, or lit the flame was really uh, something else. It was service, the sense of service. So what they used to also say to me a lot when I was growing up was that you know, everyone says Australia is a lucky country, but, but it's not. We're the lucky ones to be Australian. We're fortunate that we've been given an opportunity in this country to have a life of peace and security and, and stability, given where they'd come from. And, and the travails they'd gone through. And they always used to say, give something back to Australia, the country that's given us so much. For me, that was where that sense of service came from and propelled me to, I think, be, you know, join the public service, make my contribution. And for me, the passion was in international affairs, our, our place in the world, what Australia's identity is, what contribution we can make to a better world. Uh, and that, I think, was the, the combination that led to... Um, my passion and also my uh, engagement in international affairs. That, that's so interesting, Peter, and, and, and in a, a different but not unconnected way. My own family had a, a sort of a, a background like that, m from southern Africa, actually, and uh, growing up, I remember the, the, the substance of dinner table conversation was actually international politics, right, which is uh, probably makes... Uh, maps didn't happen in too many uh, uh, families um, around the country. Um, how, how does this interest resonate with Australian voters? I mean, we've just come through an election. Uh, did you find um, voters in the in the seat of Wills had had this on their mind? What, what sort of issues were they talking about uh, when, when they were talking to you? Uh, yes, it does resonate. And, and in a way that uh, we've been talking about this, that international affairs, foreign policy, and its interconnectedness to domestic issues, um, uh, probably... We're in a space now that we haven't seen for decades, if not probably since World War II, where they're so connected. And it's not just people understanding that the, the war in Ukraine has led to energy price increases. It's more than that. You know, you talk to any you know, local business person, builder, the, the difficulty they have in getting supply uh, of materiel, imports and so on, their businesses are, are getting crunched, containers are slowing down, all of that. They understand that that relates to our international relationships and our and our foreign policy and it's quite remarkable it's happened pretty quickly it sort of crept up on us but conversations you have with with constituents now involve foreign policy not uh, from my memory that wasn't always the case certainly when I started in 2016 it wasn't the case uh, and I remember even in the lead up to this election talking to um, the PM then opposition leader about how foreign policy now is so intertwined in in domestic politics and and foreign policy becomes a sort of an election issue in a way that it has or national security becomes that election issue people vote on in a way they haven't really in the past. So it does resonate uh, and people understand the issues. Yeah, that's really interesting and I think quite a quite a tectonic shift in, in Australian in Australian politics, so Peter. Um, I, I wanted to talk about um, the, the US. Uh, you, you and I were both quite recently in uh, in Honolulu for the Australian American, and Leadership I'm thankful Club. you're not wearing your Hawaiian shirt. Today. And um, no, normally I would, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when I'm when I'm not being a professor of practice, I'm usually in a Hawaiian shirt. It has to be has to be said. Um, but um, you know, very noticeable uh, overnight, the Prime Minister had what is at least being reported as an impromptu 40-minute meeting with the U.S. President. That's pretty unusual. Uh, you, you don't get un. 40 minutes of unscheduled time with the president, um, unless there's something really driving the, the sort of the broader state of the bilateral relationship. From from your um, experience of the US, you've been in the States quite a lot this year, what, what's your view about how 
um, the administration is thinking about security in the Indo-Pacific? Um, and, you know, what are the kind of driving factors shaping their approach at the moment? So I, I remember my first job at Defence was um, on Australia-US interoperability. Remember that? That was the whole thing in the early 2000s. Um, now the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister is talking about interchangeability. I think it's a truism, but, you know, it's obvious, but it, it, the, the relationship with the US has grown even stronger, you know, at least in the 20 years I've been in and around the, the national security space and foreign policy space. It's quite remar remarkable how healthy that relationship. So beyond even interchangeability and interoperability, the coordination, the closeness, the, the, the working together um, in diplomacy, in development, economic engagement, intelligence sharing, in cyber security in space has just taken right off, particularly over the last five years. Um, and it's just, and it was built on a foundation, a very strong foundation, we know that. But it is at a really uh, a high level now. I've not seen anything like it. Um, and so it's a very healthy relationship. I think that's probably uh, correct to say. As far as their perspective on the Indo-Pacific, you, you've seen now a real a realignment, a, re, a real commitment to engagement in, in the region. Now, we were screaming here, most of us probably remember, you know, 10 years ago, for more US engagement in, in the what was then known as the Asia Pacific, before we called it the Indo-Pacific. Um, and we had, you know, the basing in Darwin, that was good for our defence uh, side of things. We had President Obama visit Japan. Um, but there was a lot of focus on transat transatlantic issues and, and obviously the Middle East uh, and, and the war in Syria was taking up a lot of attention. And then, of course, you had the Trump years where, you know, you, you got whiplash trying to figure out what was going on back and forward. But throughout all of that, there was still that baseline engagement that we had in a bilateral sense that we built upon. But I've seen, obviously, the, uh, the US, particularly the Biden administration's commitment to the Indo-Pacific really ramp up. Uh, since, the since President Biden was elected. You know, Kirk Campbell visiting, um, you know, uh, Pacific Island nations, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, visiting the region, making a priority to visit the region. Um, you and I were at uh, Indo-PACOM, saw uh, the energy there that Admiral Aquilino, um, you know, was overseeing as far as um, uh, their mission. So there is a strong commitment um, t to the region. That's good. That's good for us. Um, I'm very happy about that. We want them engaged. And I would say, though, it's, it, it, the other side of this, too, is the economic engagement. It's like the, the, the US Indo, um, what's called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is important. It's a good start. It's got to be tangible. It's got to be substantive. Um, the President's G7 infrastructure initiatives as well, really important because we want, you know, the, the countries in the region, the Southeast Asian countries and the other countries in the region need to be incentivised to engage um, with the US in that way with something tangible, so and a real alternative to that version of state-based capitalism, the BRI, and also the tra you know, debt trap diplomacy you want to avoid. Um, you want to have a real engagement at that level as well, and I think countries are sort of sort of reaching out for that. So it's good that they're paying such attention to our region. Uh, something I found from that trip, uh, Peter, was also the sense of concern uh, that the US has around the you know the risks to peace in, in the region. Um, I mean, we, we're not um, able to go into the, the contents of those discussions because they're private, but I think g generally in, in Honolulu was a real sense of concern about time frame, and you mentioned that yourself in your speech. So th there's a real sense here that, you know, we're not talking about what used to be a kind of a 10-year horizon in defence to be concerned about security, we're actually now much more closer into real risk, wouldn't you say? Yeah, well, time is everything now. Time is of the essence, isn't it? Um, we have a lot of work to do to get ourselves in a position where we're prepared, where we think we are confident in our preparedness. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in that space. I think it's quite remarkable that um, you know, Sir Angus uh, Houston and, and Stephen Smith have completed what is a, probably the most significant uh, strategic defence review uh, in generations at a breakneck speed for those who like Star Trek, it's Warp 9. Um, I've never seen anything like it. They've set a precedent now, so any time we ever do a defence white paper in the future, no one's got an excuse to do it longer than six months. Um, but it's a tremendous effort by those two, um, uh, by Sir Angus and Stephen Smith. And of course that lays the foundation for 
um, some very big decisions that the government has to make and Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister and the, the Cabinet have to make around our defence posture, our, um, our, sorry, our force structure, our force posture, our preparedness, the defence assets, um, because all of that will, will have a massive um, effect, impact in shaping our strategic circumstance as well. And I, I believe this because, as I said earlier, we do have agency in this respect. So what we do uh, with those decisions are going to be of critical importance for the future. Um, and time, everything's being done in such a short time frame, so accelerated. Um, so, so I think that's um, the most important factor driving and compelling us towards these, these uh, decisions. I'll just want, just one more point about that. What I've seen has been quite remarkable is that, you know, for a long time, we weren't complacent, probably that's too strong a word, but most of our friends and allies were sort of chugging along at a good cruise speed, cruising speed. Um, what's happened over the last five years has, it's almost like it's woken everyone up to why why we say these things about democracy, why we're so invested in these values, these principles, why they're so important. It's a bit, you know, the, the, it can fall into cliche, our way of life, you know, and all this kind of stuff, but it's real, you know. And for those of us who come from a background like mine, where my parents, it was, it was part of our lives, that the threat to your security and, and the, the, the world that you came from was one of persecution or, you know, it wasn't free. We understand it, I think, in a way that, you know, and, and now I'm seeing that again. Yeah, the, the return of threat, uh, uh, Peter, is in, in, in the world. Um, now, we're here talking AUKUS, uh, and it's just a fact of history that AUKUS was an artefact of the previous coalition government. Does it have the legs to survive, do you think? I mean, is Labor fully committed to it? We, we've already seen two, uh, maybe on one, one counting, three prime ministers have now come and gone since AUKUS was announced. And it's only Brits a year old, well, two Brits. And then there's one in Australia which you had a, a bit to do to, to get rid of. I mean, d does AUKUS have um, longevity? Is it going to be around in 10 years, do you think? Well, that's a hard question to answer. What I can say, though, is that the commitment by the, the PM, the Defence Minister, the government is very solid. It's rock solid. I mean, in fact, when you look at when, when um, the PM was opposition leader last year when it was announced, there was um, a need to really be assured that um, AUKUS would be consistent with our non-proliferation obligations. Uh, once he and the Shadow Cabinet were satisfied uh, of that through their processes, there was a very strong commitment, a bipartisan commitment to AUKUS because he understood the strategic necessity of it. Um, he understood the, the issues at play uh, and the importance, as he always says, he does foreign policy and national security for Australia's national interest. That might not be politically um, uh, beneficial in the short term, for example, but there are tough decisions that have to be made that will make an impact to our interests, our national interests in 10 years' time. And AUKUS, and if we're going to put it around that time frame, AUKUS is probably one of those. Uh, obviously, with the submarines, it's a bit of a longer time frame, but the advanced capabilities, this is an ongoing effort. Let, let's talk about uh, uh, nuclear propulsion. I mean, obviously, that's one of the most prominent parts of the uh, of the AUKUS deal. Sort of two pillars, one nuclear propulsion, the second pillar, everything else. Uh, but it's certainly one that gets, I think, the most uh, uh, media attention. And, and it's not without controversy, Peter. So, mm. I mean, what, what what's your perspective on the, the nuclear propulsion issue? Um, there, there's certainly, I think, even it's fair to say, um, inside your own party, some degree of reservation around nuclear power, at least. Mm. How, what what are your thoughts about that particular issue? Well, I I thought I'd get this question, so I've been practicing the word nuclear in front of the mirror. So you know, right. so I say not briefly, nuclear, nu not nuclear. I was there during the Bush administration in, in the US, but. Um, Look, the commitment to non-proliferation non is unchanged, you know, to our obligations, uh, is, is unwavering. And I've got to say, um, you know, w despite all the misinformation and the disinformation and the uh, kind of, um, whether it was in the media and, and, or even out of some parts of, uh, of the region, um, this was always purely about a propulsion, a source of power for a propulsion system, and a submarine propulsion system. That's what it was about. Um, and, you know, we are fully committed to that non-proliferation regime. Uh, and in fact, as I said earlier, the, the, 
the Shadow Cabinet and the, and the uh, PM, as opposition leader, went through that process to determine uh, and to be satisfied that we would be um, consistent, it would be consistent with our obligations. That's a very important part of it. Um, if you look at uh, the MPT, which is the cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime, we, we, our support is unchanged, it's unwavering in that, in that regime. Um, and frankly, the MPT does not bar naval propulsion, propulsion systems. Um, and so, you know, you had the Director General of the IAEA out here in July. He was reassured and, and very confident in, in Australia's unwavering support in that regime. Uh, his report, uh, the IAEA report in September into the, or, or, in relation to AUKUS and the, and the uh, safeguards regime was also very positive in the fact that, you know, the AUKUS partners were uh, and committed to very high standards of non-proliferation. Uh, so all of that is, is good and now people are working in that space to ensure that you know, there are strong verification uh, safeguards and all of the elements of the regime uh, are, um, are worked through. So I think that, um, and you touched on the, the Labor Party, yes there was, there was some question marks there but I think there's a very strong backing now given what I've just explained. I, it seems to me, that, I, I mean I've, I've read the, the case against if you like, which uh, a, a number of uh, um, not not real international friends have been pushing very aggressively in, in the region uh, for why this is a proliferation concern. And it, frankly, it doesn't stack up to me, Peter. I mean, I, I've, I've seen it acknowledged, well, you know, it might be theoretically possible to extract, um, you know, weapons grade plutonium from a sealed reactor. Uh, but the process of doing it would probably kill the person who was actually <laughs> well, engaged in that task. Well, well, let's be clear about this. We're not seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. We're not seeking to reprocess. Uh, we're not seeking to do fuel fabrication. We, um, we're committed to the non-proliferation regime. I mean, these are really important points. Yeah. The, 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 whether it's the US or the UK reactor, it's closed up, it's welded, you know. Um, it's, that's whole of life service right there, which means we don't uh, have to refuel during the, 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 the service of that um, sub. So I think, uh, as I said, a lot of it was misinformation or disinformation um, or misunderstanding, um, but that we've done a fair bit of work in the public relations space to, to clarify where we stand. So where would you like to see these submarines based, uh, Peter? <laughs> That's not my decision, uh, Peter. And I think there's a... Uh, isn't it generally going to be in the East Coast? Some people might know. Oh, good, good, yeah. good answer. Yeah, I well, I noticed there is a, a lobby effort going on at the moment to uh, get some of them over to the that, West. That Kim. utterly ridiculous. <laughs> what you've done in West Australia, you're obvious. OK. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Kim. Have they already have a base? Uh, yeah. just, just thought I'd try asking <laughs> you that one. Look, uh, another aspect, it's, it's kind of related to AUKUS, although it, it has a longer history, and, and that is the... Um, the larger scale American presence up, up north. Mm. Uh, and just recently, uh, ABC Four Corners had, uh, I, I frankly think, a rather alarmist take on the arrival of, or well, the planned arrival of um, half a dozen B-52s that are going to uh, sort of stage out of, uh, out of Tyndall. Mm. We've we've hardened some stands for these aircraft to, to park on, uh, Peter. That, that that's what we've done. But again, um, potentially controversial. What what what's your take on that American presence in in the north? Okay, so a couple of facts. Um, U.S. bombers have been coming in since the 80s. Um, they've been training up north since I think 2005 or 2006. Um, I welcome any upgrade and, and enhancement of our bases, including Tyndall up north. Uh, any enhancement of our infrastructure is good for us. Um, but here's the interesting thing. It's also good for, you know, expanding the, the capacity of those bases, the infrastructure for our international partners. You were there when we got a fantastic briefing on Pitch Black um, by, um, was it Com um, Air Commodore uh, Goldie? Darren or Goldie. Darren Goldie. At the 17 international partners that were working together on, on pitch black, that training exercise, this is good for us. It's good to be able to engage with air forces of the region, work work together, work effectively together, improve our coordination. So that, that's how I see that. Um, then also the misunderstanding part of this is that, you know, that kind of long-range strike capability is not about escalating things or uh, building on tensions as how it was reported. It's the inverse as I've tried to explain. It gives us another um, quill, if I want to call it that, uh, or an additional quill that allows us to uh, deter, but also 
to push um, players into decisions or a calculus that pushes them more towards uh, stability rather than escalating towards conflict. Did you ever expect defence and security to be such a large part of, of this government's agenda? Yes, I did, actually, because um, we touched on earlier how the, the interconnectedness of foreign affairs and domestic politics had well, it started to intertwine, certainly over the last couple of years. And in the handful of conversations I had with the, the PM and, and the DPM uh, when we were in opposition around these issues, um, what struck me was they were right on top of the strategic issues, defence, national security, how important it was. I understood um, its importance to the national interest, they were formulating thoughts and ideas around our, our path. Um, and, and the PM really understood the strategic issues um, and the big and important decisions uh, that he and, and the Deputy PM and the, the Cabinet would have to make if we were to win government. So I could see that trajectory uh, as to how important it was. And of course, um, you know, the, the politics of this is, is intertwined as well. So you have to get this right um, and be able to explain to the Australian people. I still think we have a bit more work to do with the narrative around these issues. Funnily enough, though, when you talk to most of the sort of the general public about this, they instinctively get it mm. without knowing all the details. The punters kind of get the, the, the contest and they understand what needs to be done without knowing all the ins and outs. It's, I, I actually think it's more, not this room probably, but maybe the media, maybe the... Um, well, the media understands it too, but different elements of, of society might have uh, a misunderstanding about some of these strategic issues. Do, do you think um, voters get that we're likely to have to spend a lot more on defence than has typically been the Australian approach over, you know, many, many decades? Well, in my, I can only talk about the conversations I have with my constituents, so there's an understanding there. Mm. Some people don't agree with, with increased defence spending. Some do understand the need for it when, when you talk through the challenges that we're facing. Um, but, you know, if I'm talking to that builder who can't get the material in and stuff, and I say, look, our naval capability is all about protecting the sea lanes for our trade. They get it straight away. Mm. So you want us to get certainty of supply chain? It's about defence spending. And they immediately understand that. Now, I'm, I'm going to go to the audience uh, in a few minutes, but I've got a couple of questions uh, still to ask, Peter. I'm, I'm interested in uh, getting some insight from you about your work on the various committees that you're oh, yeah. a member of, uh, but in particular your, your uh, chairmanship of the yeah. uh, 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 Intelligence and Security Committee, which has kind of emerged, I think, as... Um, a, 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 I'm trying to think of the right word. A slightly different to the rest of the... Um, committee structure in Parliament. Uh, it, it has much more engagement with uh, classified material. It's got a reputation for being pretty bipartisan and a, and a fairly high workload. Can you just talk about your experience of that committee and you know what are the sort of things which are um, occupying you and committee members uh, at the moment? Well, I was shocked. Uh, even though I was a member of the committee uh, late last year, it was sort of over the Christmas period as a new member and so on, I was shocked at, at, at coming in as chair at the intensity of the workload, the volume of work that this committee has to get through. Um, you, you're right about the bipartisanship. It's a, it has a tradition of bipartisanship, which I'm seeking to continue. And the uh, genuine goodwill of members from either side of the aisle on that committee to work through issues to get the best possible national security laws for the country. And we might disagree on how to get there, but we go through a, a really good process to in, and of, of engagement in that committee. Um, it's kind of like there's some serious stuff to do. We can't muck around with some of this partisan stuff. Let's really focus on what needs to happen. And there, as I said, there are different views on that, but uh, it's been a really good committee to work on. Um, the intensity of the workload and also the, the, the type of work, which is so important to our national security, you know, we have statutory uh, oversight over a number of um, uh, laws that we have to do on a regular basis. We have oversight reviews, we have statutory reviews. You know, currently we're looking, you know, we, we regularly look at the administration expenditure of all of the, the intelligence and security agencies of the country and report to government on the efficacy of, of, of how we're utilising taxpayer dollars in our intelligence services and security services. Um, we, we do things like go through the, we're going currently through the uh, temporary exclusions order or review uh, around that, a foreign interference transparency scheme. Um, we, we do regular 
reviews of listing and relisting of terrorist organisations and review those that, that are made by the Minister. And then there's a whole series of other bills or any national security bill, frankly, that w will come to us f for us to go through uh, to make recommendations to the government. And then we look at laws that have already been on the books for a couple of years and, and determine their efficacy and whether they've worked. Um, so there's a lot there. There's a lot going on. Um, and it's important work. And, you know, you're, you're in, as you say, that you're looking at a lot of classified material. You're in a, a secure facility for long periods of time. And most of us now, now, now know when you don't look at your phone for a couple of hours, it almost explodes with messages. So that's a challenge. Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I was very honoured that the Prime Minister asked me to be chair of, of the committee and um, noted the importance of the work, particularly in the period of time that we're in. So I, I consider it a privilege and an honour to be serving in this capacity. Is there an AUKUS dimension or could there be an AUKUS dimension to the work of the committee going forward? Well, ministers have um, uh, the right to refer to us anything that they would like us to look at. So if the Defence Minister, for instance, wants us to look at intelligence aspects of AUKUS, that, that'll be a decision for the Minister. Um, uh, or, you know, so that, that's how that works. But uh, I, you did say I was Deputy Chair of the Treaties Committee. I was formerly Deputy Chair when in opposition. And we actually looked at the, MO, um, the what do they call it, the agreement? Mm -hmm. um, that, that, so that was a sort of a treaty status document. So we went through all of that as part of the treaty committee work. So um, I'm sure there'll be some things referred to us going forward. Uh, uh, Peter, I just a uh, little point of detail, but I, it might be of interest to um, a, a Canberra audience. Uh, I mean, obviously, we, the, the, the composition of the parliament has changed quite considerably. Mm. We've got a, a larger number of uh, crossbenchers. We've, we've got a, a different composition of the, uh, of the crossbench in the Senate. H how does that impact on committee work and does it put at risk in any way the um, that sort of broader bipartisan approach that we've seen with the major parties? Um, I've taken the view that I am very, very happy to talk to the crossbench about any issues that they may have or want to discuss in relation to intelligence security, notwithstanding um, obviously with class classified material and, and, and so on, uh, talking about them in, in a what's there publicly to discuss. I'm very happy to go through that with them if they have any queries. Um, the, um, the committee itself, the Intelligence Security Committee, doesn't have any crossbench members on it. It's um, by legislation, the Int Intelligence Services Act sets out clearly that um, there would be uh, six government members and five opposition members. Um, and then they're very, it's very prescriptive about how many from the Senate and how many from the, from the House. So that's a very a p big part of the, the, the act itself. Um, but I'm always op open for respectful and open dialogue. And I think it's important to explain these issues. You know, if you don't, people just, you know, the vacuum gets filled by misinformation. So it's important that our political class, right throughout both sides of politics, the crossbench, understand the strategic issues at play. They may form their own views about which direction we take and w what policies we should implement, but they should at least be fully informed and, and understanding, have a baseline, if you like, around some big strategic issues that Australia's facing. Uh, Peter, I, I don't think we should um, uh, finish, or I don't think our conversation should finish without having uh, just uh, touching briefly on Ukraine, the situation in Ukraine. Um, quite big developments over the last 48 hours or so with the, um, the Russians um, voluntarily, if that's the right word. I, I, I think the right way to describe it would be under immense pressure, um, uh, deciding to withdraw uh, forces from Kherson, probably the, uh, one of the biggest strategic advances for Ukraine in the last sort of six weeks or so. Uh, and of course, we're now going into winter. Um, what, what, are, what are your thoughts about the, the current state of the, the conflict? Well, a couple of things first. You touched on visits to DC. The two mainly two things that there were bipartisanship on in Washington were the support for the Ukrainians, although that was fraying a little bit from some of the, the on the edge, and, and our, their commitment to the Indo-Pacific vis-a-vis, um, you know, our challenges in the region. Um, everything else was a complete, you know, crapshoot, as they call it. Um, with respect to this um, counteroffensive, it's been so effective. The real question now in my mind has, has been, will... Um, at what point do, do some of the Europeans, and I'm talking now about you know, whether it's President Macron or we saw Scholz's visit to Beijing, whether they insert themselves to try and negotiate a settlement or a negotiated outcome uh, between Putin and Zelensky post the winter, you know, come February, March, 
depending on what happens in that space. Um, I think my understanding is that the Europeans, certainly the French and others, have some reserves that may see them through the, the winter. Uh, gas um, exploration and reserves out of Cyprus are still a couple of years away, although they're becoming e more economically viable. And, and Greece, Cyprus and Egypt actually are working together, and Israel are working together to, to make that happen as an alternative supply to, to Western Europe and Europe. Um, what does Putin do? You know, it's interesting, you know, everyone talks about that rat story. I don't know if you've, you've read that, uh, the cornered rat story when he was a kid. Um, you know, that the rat sort of lashes out. This is what everyone's afraid of. Does he lash out? and Does he use a, a tactical nuclear weapon? What does he do in that context? Um, it seems to me, though, that if he's withdrawing from Kherson and he's going to try and draw a line to, to protect some of that, that, the gains that he made in the eastern flank, I suspect that if Crimea is even at risk of being lost to him, he may come to the table to try and hold on to some of those gains. And of course, President Zelensky has been very clear cut about not giving an inch and wanting every part of Ukrainian sovereign territory returned. So how, how the Western Europeans particularly, I mean, the Eastern Europeans are very, I mean, they're on the front line, so that they're very clear about uh, not giving Putin anything, no reward for, for this aggression. Um, will Macron, will Schultz, will, will others seek to try and push for some sort of negotiated settlement? And would Putin want to do that? Um, and that, that, that's an unanswered question. Uh, internally, there, obviously, um, it's hard to see inside, but there's, there's obviously um, a lot of stress and strain on him. Um, so it, there's a lot of things that might play out during the winter. And I guess for us, you know, we've supported Ukraine. Australia has been the largest non-NATO military contributor to Ukraine. Some over 500 million in military assistance and, and, and then also non-humanitarian -human, um, or non-lethal non assistance as well. That has been a massive effort by both sides of politics for the previous government and then we've continued on and, and expanded that as well. Uh, and Prime Minister Albanese has been very clear about his support because it, it's, not, it's not the other side of the world stuff. This matters to us. It matters to us because uh, Putin invaded illegally, immorally, brutally invaded the sovereign territory of another nation. That, that's just unacceptable. And if we allow those kind of actions to become normalised in the system, um, our vol the volatile period we're, we're facing becomes a whole lot more dangerous than just volatility. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and in fact, I think Australia's position has... I, I would like Australia to do more, but I think Australia has done a lot and has been very effective in terms of its international advocacy for uh, sticking with Ukraine and continuing to support them. Um, and, and I rather imagine that that would be Albanese's instinct going forward, Peter. I, I, I can't see there's going to be a slackening of Australian support, even if some of the European countries might be wavering a bit. I think you might be right in that, Peter, given our position to this point in time. Um, but, you know, obviously, not, not about Australia, but now what happens post the winter is what everyone's going to be looking at. Yeah. So, folks, we've got um, in the order of about uh, 10 minutes or so, perhaps just a little bit longer. Peter's got, I think, a day of committee work to get back to uh, 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 and, and therefore a hard finish uh, with us. But I'd like to now turn over the floor to uh, folk here, and I have to put my glasses on for the, for the purposes of doing that. It'll be the usual uh, exercise. If you can please just put your hand up to... Uh, 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 show you want to ask a question uh, and there are some roving mics so please identify yourself first and, and sir we'll go to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Michael Sharp, I'm with the Nuclear Skills Forum. I represent a range of industry and so the skills around what we'll need in the coming years. Um, you talked about uh, defining what AUKUS is to the general public. Uh, I saw a few years ago when we launched the Australian Space Agency there was a wide campaign through the schools through the communities and it really enthused a lot of industry to engage in the space sector. So we now have a range of manufacturing companies that are involved with space projects. I'm just wondering what you think about communications for what AUKUS is in the coming years. Uh, yeah, thank you and, and it's great to see uh, that you also pronounce nuclear correctly, given your role. Um, look, the, I know we probably need to do better in comms, but we're doing as much as we can. I know the Deputy Prime Minister announced some uh, training that uh, Australian submariners will be doing on the astute class. Um, there's some um, uh, educational opportunities that I think it's Betis or some of these other things in, in, that our Navy are participating in. 
um, to get up to speed and, and build up skills. But obviously the education side of things is, is a massive um, challenge because, you know, nuclear uh, physicists, uh, what do you call it? nuclear physicists and engineers and PhD students just don't pop out of the ground like mushrooms. There's years and years of work. Um, it's interesting you say, because uh, in the space context, it's, it's actually an easy play. It's like, it excites people. When I went to NASA, the Jet Propul JPL in, 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 in America, I remember asking the Director General of NASA, oh, do you have trouble competing with all these sort of tech companies in, in San Francisco and so on? Like, you know, the companies that have a full bar at the end of every workstation and a, and a, a, a hill for their pets to climb and free yogurt and free lunch and whatever. And he said, no, I don't. And, and the reason is because we give them a purpose, a sense of purpose, a sense of history, a sense of being part of a mission that's greater than themselves. It's part of human history. And it's not just doing an algorithm for a transport company, you know? So he ha NASA has that advantage. It's interesting in the nuclear space, how do you translate that? Like, where do you build the excitement around working in this space? Because obviously with nuclear power, and there's a whole other debate about, um, you know, uh, nuclear uh, energy and all this kind of stuff, you know, there, there's a lot of contestability in that space. So it's harder to build that narrative, that positive narrative. I think it's still possible because you can do it through the angle of, of saying you're going to be part of something really, really important um, at the high, sort of highest levels of science and um, a contribution to our security and our interests. Um, that could be the angle that we sort of pursue. But it certainly has to be part of our broader efforts, the communications effort, because we need young people to study this. We need young people to get involved in that workforce and see it as a career path. I, I can't think of a cooler job than being a nuclear submariner, <laughs> other than maybe being a professor of practice at UNSW, oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Um, uh, Ambassador De Gettis, a question from you. <coughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you both, Peters. So actually, I know you very well. So. Uh, I would uh, tell, first of all, I would like to, to thank Australian government for its impressive support to Ukraine. That's, that's, that's very important. Uh, both parties, bipartisan support, that was excellent uh, what you did. And uh, I just spoke uh, a couple of days ago with uh, our chair of the Foreign Relations Committee at the Parliament of Lithuania. That chair went to Ukraine, to Kiev, and uh, actually he told me, as I mentioned, note that I will be coming here for this particular conference, and, uh, and he told me, look, ask all Australian people how Ukrainians are affiliating to Australia. What is the word for every Ukrainian in Kiev which they affiliate to Australia? What is the word? Would you, would you be able to answer this? I'm going to have a guess. Bushmaster? Exactly, exactly. This is the word. This is the word, the Bushmaster. So actually, well, I know that there are plenty of people from defense uh, forces, so please do this. Please uh, support uh, Ukraine as much as you can. So I know that you are one of the leading states of the non-NATO member states that you are supporting. Well, but in any case, so thank you very much, uh, um, Peter, for uh, joining the Baltic Friendship Group. We, we just established... Uh, a week ago, but I should also mention that uh, this is the first embassy. Lithuania has the first embassy in Australia. And we also had the, the three other embassies in the Indo-Pacific area, in South Korea, in Singapore, and also we established an economic mission last week in Taiwan. That's very important. We also understand that there are many strategic challenges and probably we also know that there is an axis of evil, Russia and China. And we commend Australia's, UK's, and US wonderful program of AUKUS. It's important because that will deter these crucial challenges. Allow me to ask, what at this moment, when uh, the Prime Minister will be meeting uh, uh, in Bali with uh, probably the President of China, what do you think will be in a short term and in the long term, Australia's position to China? Thank you. Well, that's a tough question. I'll try and keep it brief. But um, firstly, the support for Ukraine, I've always seen uh, too in the context of a, a broader global strategic contest that, that is underway. And that is 
uh, it might be a bit reductionist to say it's authoritarianism versus democracy because it also you know, it includes countries who want to protect a, a rules-based order. Countries like Vietnam, for example, who, you know, f fit into that bill and not exactly, uh, you know, a, a democracy in, in, in the sense that we put it. Um, but that contest is really, it's the contest of the 21st century. It's, it determines how, what our world will be like going forward. Um, and to your point about our relationship with China, I've always said it's important that we open up dialogue. It's important that we talk. It's important that we reduce tensions. This is what the foreign minister has been attempting to do in her engagement with Wang. Uh, our deputy prime minister has met with uh, his counterpart. Um, dialogue is good. And Prime Minister Albanese has said, you know, very open and willing to, to, to talk and engage with China, who, who are a very important economic partner. But the government's always also said very clearly that we are, aren't going to take a backward step on our, our values, on our commitment to human rights, on our commitment to democracy, our commitment to the rules-based order. Um, and there are no preconditions that could be put to us to, to start that dialogue. Um, it's important, you know, and he said very clearly, it's important that China removes those economic barriers and, and, and to our, our trade and our exports. So I, I think the government's position is pretty firm. Remembering that the, 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 when I said earlier about the multilateral effort to defend and protect that liberal rules-based, and I say liberal rules-based order not because George is in the room, it's not Liberal Party, George. It's liberal in the sense of a commitment to human rights, to the rule of law, um, to those principles and values that, that have stood us in, in such good stead. That is not just about defence capability, it's about diplomacy, uh, development assistance, I touched on the economic engagement in the region, uh, intelligence, cyber, coordination around cyber, security and so on and so forth. All of those things combined are what can help us protect that rules-based order that has served so many nations in the region so well. Um, and it's all about, you know, as I said, the trajectory that China has is not, um, it, it's not um, absolute, it's not guaranteed, it can be shifted very hard to do maybe but it can we do have agency we can change uh, the calculus if you like um, and it can't just be defense it's got to be all these other elements as well and that's part of our diplomatic effort here to engage on in that respect um, and I hope it works absolutely we want to find the way through to avoid uh, confrontation and conflict in our region it, it doesn't serve China well frankly it doesn't serve anyone well in the region the impact on um, and I've said this publicly, the impact on the global economy would be horrific. The impact on China's economy would be horrific if, if we were unable to uh, reduce that tension or, or avoid uh, confrontation. So it's good that now we are in a space where we're talking. What is the long-term future of the relationship? They are an e important economic partner. We will continue to work in the region to uphold that rules-based order. Um, these are our objectives, and I think that's a good guidepost, if you like, to how this government is is managing and navigating through these kind of uh, difficult this difficult period. So we have time for perhaps two um, uh, sharply focused questions, not lengthy speeches, please. Uh, we're starting over here, ma'am. And uh, here comes the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is Mineko Sakai. I'm an associate professor from UNSW Canberra, and I work on Indonesia particularly. And I just wondered about um, how this particular framework of AUKUS could be uh, promoted, particularly in the region of, uh, with a focus on Indonesia, because I have read um, sort of some anxieties uh, coming from the region, and in order to uh, establish sort of securities, peace, and um, is there any kind of particular way the government is thinking about promoting this particular um, August framework to uh, engage with Indonesia? Thank you very much. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Because AUKUS is not just, I mean, it is Australia, US and the UK, but what we know, we have a challenge or a task, if you like, to be able to explain clearly the purpose and the objectives of this trilateral um, technology accelerator and why it's important and beneficial, not just for our three countries, but for the security and the stability of the region as well, for, for, for those countries and in region, including Indonesia. Um, and so I think one of the things there, just to, to point out, the Prime Minister um, has a wonderful relationship that he's, he's, he has with President Widodo. Uh, in fact, it, I think it was mentioned in the media that 
um, Prime Minister Albanese's commitment to President Widodo to attend the G20, regardless of uh, all this politics around Putin's attendance and so on, was really something that um, President Widodo took took on and was so appreciative of, and it really established a good relationship. Um, I think, if I can say this too, I think the Indonesians like the humble nature of our PM. You know, he's not in your face. It's more of a Javanese sensibility, isn't it, really, where you, you are, you know, you get things done, but you're not, you know, you're, you're quite, there's a degree of humility there, and, and the PM's always been like that. Um, so it's a really good start, and I think that allows us to better explain through the highest levels why what we're doing through AUKUS and the Quad and all the other uh, elements of our diplomatic and, and defence strategies in the region. And, of course, we want to work with Indonesia. I know they, they have a very strong... Um, studied neutrality, if that makes sense. I, I, I get that. Um, but for us, it's important. They, they're, they're one of the largest democracies in the world. They're our northern neighbour. They're an hour flight from Darwin. I've always thought it was madness, and I was saying this, by the way, 10 years ago, that um, we have just left that relationship in some benign neglect almost, particularly the economic relationship. I was shocked that our two-way trade with Indonesia, when we were looking at the Indonesian-Australian free trade agreement through the treaties committee last year, was 2%. Like, it makes no sense, you know? Uh, I mean, this is governments of both sides, it's industry, everyone didn't want to do the hard yards. Now we have to do the hard yards, the economic, the engagement, the cultural, the, the trade. We've got to work hard. We've got to actually diversify these relationships. And Indonesia wants that. They want us, they want to engage with us in that respect as well. Beyond just a, a, a tourist destination of Bali, it's so much more than that. Um, there's so much potentiality there. And I think we have a really good baseline with, with, with the relationship at the, at the highest level. We've got to work now to get it down through. And I would love to be able to take the committee to uh, Indonesia as well and, and, and do that kind of engagement at the parliamentary level. Is, is there a case, Peter, ever for AUKUS to um, expand and take on new members? Uh, I mean, I think at the moment its first responsibility is to deliver something soon, but uh, beyond that, is there a case for a, a, a J in AUKUS at any stage or, or any other country you might like to know? <laughs> well, I don't want to steal the thunder of uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Yamagami's speech later today, um, but I would say, having had dinner at... Um, and the generous hospitality that the uh, ambassador has shown us, uh, just alone on the world-class uh, hospitality and reception the, and, the, and the world-class chef that he has, I would include Japan <laughs> into AUKUS just because of that. <laughs> um, but you're right, Peter, there's a bit of work to be done. We have to deliver on it. Um, and, and I think um, uh, the ambassador is talking later today, I think I was reading in the paper about where Japan can engage with Australia, US and the UK. But, you know, the, fa the fact is, as I said earlier, don't see AUKUS just as, you know, this thing on its own. It is part, it's an element that links into all the other parts of the architecture, which Japan, you know, uh, the, 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 the um, agreement made by uh, Prime Minister Kishida and Prime Minister Albanese recently is another example of how strong our alliance and our friendship and our partnership is with Japan. It's, it's a fantastic relationship uh, that we continue to build on. So these are just bits of, of a, a broader collective effort. Um, and if there is an opportunity there to work with, with other partners, I think that was something that, I mean, there's a lot of work being done now just to deliver. So we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully in the future, it's, we'll be able to do that as well. Well, Peter, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It's been a, a great conversation and I think uh, really good, if I may say, for a Canberra audience, uh, a group of national security focused uh, people to get to know you a little bit more and, and we've really appreciated your uh, your openness in the way that you've uh, uh, had this discussion with, uh, with us this morning. Uh, colleagues, we're, we're going to move directly into um, uh, another session now, so no one gets to leave the room at this point. We, we'll just reorganise, except for Peter, uh, we'll, we'll reorganise now for, for our panel discussion and, and there'll, be, uh, there'll be coffee after that. But in the meantime, can I please ask you to thank Peter Khalil?